Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Wednesday, October 12th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, as the mainstream media continues to obsess over the leaked locker room talk about women, Donald Trump drops an avalanche of WikiLeaks bombshells and pledges to investigate the investigation of Hillary's deleted emails. Then, social media explodes with Bill Clinton rape allegations as protesters target the Clinton campaign trail and disrupt the mainstream news media. And the establishment Republicans have a message for Donald Trump. Stop talking about the rigged elections. That system is set up so that the crooked politicians can make sure they get somebody in that's not, you know, part of what we're doing. This is a movement, folks. All that plus the religion of peace wants world domination. Up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, the media, the government, even the central banks are pulling out all the stops to make everything look wonderful so that Hillary Clinton can get elected. If things look dodgy, it's going to help Donald Trump. So they want things to look as good as possible. However... Some of them are starting to sound the warnings of reality. We now have a red alert being issued by HSBC on the stock market. And as Business Insider says, this is the ultimate warning signal. Now, Murray Gunn, who's head of technical analysis for HSBC, has said that he has turned on a red alert for an imminent sell-off in stocks given the price action over the past couple of weeks. And, of course, it's not just HSBC, but it's also Citibank's Tom Fitzpatrick has also highlighted the market's similarities to the 1987 crash, and he did it just a few days ago. On September 30th, Gunn said that stocks were under an orange alert as they looked to him as they had topped out. Now he is changing that to a red alert. And, of course, it's not just the stock market that they've been propping up. They're also propping up Obamacare. Now, you've heard many times people talking about how much trouble the Obamacare uh, exchanges are and how they're going to delay letting people know how their premiums are going to skyrocket. They want to do that after the election as well. Now, conservative groups are putting pressure on the GOP to block the Obamacare bailouts. Why would they do that? Why would it be necessary for them to put pressure on the GOP? Wouldn't you think that the GOP who have been elected the last couple of elections to get rid of Obamacare, wouldn't you think that they would not be inclined to do bailouts? Well, of course they are, because the GOP is being run by people like Paul Ryan-O and people like Mitch McConnell, who have absolutely no problem with Obamacare. As a matter of fact, they are the controlled opposition on this, as we've seen time and time again. That's why we have an outsider like Donald Trump who's running, because the electorate the GOP voters are fed up with it. They're fed up with sending people like Paul Ryan to Congress who do nothing. And you can see that in his opposition to Donald Trump. Now, The Hill points out a coalition of more than 50 conservative groups are calling on Congress to stop the bailouts of insurance companies under Obamacare. And the conservative groups are now pressuring Republicans, of course, because it's not. You would think that the Republicans would be with us on this. You would think that they would have to put pressure on the Democrats. But that's the problem that we run into when we allow these rhinos in office. And that really underscores the issues behind the never Trump people saying, look, we can fight Hillary Clinton. We've seen Glenn Beck say this, that oh, we make the moral choice and then we can fight Hillary Clinton using Congress and using the media and so forth and so on. Congress and the media are with Hillary Clinton. And you're going to have to fight her on every single issue if she gets in with Donald Trump. And he's right on many of the key issues. And, of course, there'll be some issues on which he's wrong, and we can try to convince him. We can fight him on that as well. You're not going to convince Hillary Clinton. She is bought and paid for and owned by the bankers. Now, today we had uh, Governor Pence at Liberty University, and he's talking to Christians there, and he's saying what you need to do is to forgive Donald Trump for this tape that was uh, cut 10 years ago that was released to distract attention from the emails that uh, came out. And... Uh, I guess really what we ought to look at with this is really he's calling on them to reject a policy of calculated defama defamation, a policy of direct character assassination. Uh, this is a policy that has come from the Bushes, from the Clintons. It's come from the Democrats and the Republicans because it's the establishment that is threatened by Donald Trump. Many Christians don't understand this, but Mike Pence said that uh, Christians should forgive Donald Trump. He says as Christians were called to forgive even as we have been forgiven. He said, Sunday night, my running mate showed humility. He showed what was in his heart, 
to the American people. But today, Obama is in North Carolina, and he's ridiculing Christians who say that they would forgive Donald Trump. Obama says, well, I'm a Christian, and so I'm all about forgiveness because nobody's perfect. If somebody does something terrible, I can forgive them, I suppose, if they're sincere about it. But I don't want them necessarily leading the country. Would he say that about Bill Clinton? When we found out that Bill Clinton was running for re-election and he had raped these women, he had sexually assaulted them. We're not talking about consensual sex. That's the way Ken Starr covered for Bill Clinton. He had a long list of corruption of violent crimes against women, but he chose to focus on perjury that was committed about consensual sex with Monica Lewinsky. So he got that little tiny uh, thing there and committed him, uh, uh, got him impeached on perjury. But they let the big crimes go. So is Obama saying that he, uh, he doesn't necessarily want people leaving the country? Understand that Bill raped them, Hillary went to war against them, and they haven't asked for forgiveness. They haven't even acknowledged their crimes, okay? Donald Trump said uh, he would like to commit adultery with this woman, and he struck out. Bill doesn't strike out. If you say no, he just keeps going, okay? That's the reality of it, and he hasn't apologized or even acknowledged it, and neither has Hillary Clinton. And there was an article from the AP today asking, why do evangelicals prefer Donald Trump to Hillary Clinton? And a couple of evangelical leaders have come out and said, well, that's it. I don't like what he had to say. I don't like the fact that he wanted to commit adultery. I don't like the language that he's using, so I'm not going to support him. The wiser evangelical leaders, people like James Dobson, a focus on the family, a family talk, came out and said, we have to understand that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton's support for abortion is criminal. How do you make an equivalence there? Do you understand that if you vote for Hillary Clinton, not only is she going to murder children and support that, murdering them for their body parts, but she is also going to shut down your religious freedom. She's going to put a gag rule on you Christians, and that's just the beginning of it. Can't you understand that? Of course, uh, some others understand that as well. Jerry Falwell Jr. understands that not only is that the are those the key issues involved here, that there are key moral differences between the policies that we would have between these two uh, people as president, but he also understands that this whole thing was a setup. Just understand that whether or not you believe that Donald Trump has repented, whether or not you believe that Donald Trump is a Christian, really isn't relevant. Remember, going back to the Bible, where God used leaders that were pagan leaders, that uh, did all kinds of things, and yet he would use them to deliver his people, people like kings like uh, Darius that he would use to uh, deliver his people, or Cyrus, he would take them by the hand, he said, to deliver his people. Would they say, I'm sorry, I don't want to be delivered because this guy has got some, uh, he worships idols, uh, he's got uh, a thousand different wives or whatever the problems were that they had with him. No, we need to understand that there's some key issues. And for Christians alone, the issues of abortion and the First Amendment should be enough to make that decision very clear for you what the moral decision is. Now, Republicans are also, the Republican establishment, are telling Donald Trump to quit claiming that it's going to be a rigged election. Oh, really? Okay, we've got uh, Lindsey Graham saying, I don't think leading candidates for the presidency should undercut the process unless you have a really good reason. Yeah, by all means, protect the status quo. Protect the status quo. Don't ever give anybody an idea that there's something dishonest about the system. Even as the government is continually talking about how they need to take over the elections and monitor it to keep the Russians from interfering. Okay, so are the GOP and the Democrat leaders, uh, are the establishment saying that we're not going to blame the Russians, that we should uh, not worry about that? No, of course not. They're trying to get everybody concerned about the Russians, whether or not that's a real attack. As a matter of fact, when they say that it's the Russians that's rele that are releasing this information, understand the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence have given us a reason for why they think it's the Russians. They said, well, we think based on the scope and the sensitivity of these efforts, based on the motives and the uh, methods of these, it looks like a Russian-directed effort. So they don't have any real hard evidence on this. They just say, well, it looks like something the Russians would want to do. Why would the Russians want to do that? It's because the Obama administration and Hillary Clinton have stepped up uh, the Cold War. They recreated the Cold War. We now have a new Cold War that didn't exist until a couple of years ago. And they're very concerned about that. As a matter of fact, uh, they see it as a badge of honor that they won't even talk to Vladimir Putin. And even Gorbachev has said this is the most dangerous situation that we could have, that we do not even talk to each other. 
Yeah, certainly the Russians have a motivation to see somebody other than Obama and Hillary Clinton. And we have a motivation if we don't want to have a World War III breakout. But that is not reason enough to say that the Russians are behind this hack, whether or not they are. But the issue is, what is in the information? And coming up and later in the broadcast, we're going to have a roundtable discussion. We had a fourth release of WikiLeaks documents today, but that's still only about 10% of what Julian Assange says he has. But is there a real issue with the elections? Just in the last couple of days, we've seen a couple of Project Veritas uh, stings showing one, a Manhattan Democrat uh, who's on the city board of elections saying uh, de Blasio is just giving out ID cards. You can use those ID cards for anything. They didn't vet people to see who they really were. Anybody can go in there and say, I want an ID card. He says it's absolutely absurd. There's a lot of fraud, not just voter fraud, but all kinds of fraud. That's why I get more conservative as I get older, he said. And then they asked, so why don't we have uh, some IDs so that we can stop some of this uh, rampant voter fraud? And he said, well, the law says you can't ask for anything, which they really should be able to do. See, this is in New York. Even in North Carolina, when we see people there saying we need to have photo ID to validate that this person who's on the list, the registrar list, is really the person who's voting, they say, no, that's racism. That's racism from, uh, the, uh, from Reconstruction or whatever, Jim Crow laws. This is in New York. This is in New York. You can't look at voter. You can't look at photo ID for voting anywhere, and yet that's the only place that you're not allowed to look for photo ID. Meanwhile, a Hillary campaign staffer in another Project Veritas uh, exposure is seen telling someone that ripping up GOP voter forms is just fine. This is another Project Veritas. They said a field organizer for a Clinton campaign and a Democratic Party of Florida in West Palm Beach, Trevor. La, F La Fauci, a Clinton campaign staffer, agreed that ripping up registration forms from Republicans should be fine. He says, well, if I rip up completed VR forms like uh, 20 of them, I think I'll just get reprimanded. I don't think I would get fired. And then he says, well, after being told that someone else ripped up Republican registration forms, uh, the other man said, yeah, that should be fine. When the journalist from Project Veritas confronted these two guys about the comments that they made on camera, they both refused to comment and simply walked away. That's the way Hillary Clinton, that's the way the Democrats handle scandals. They just pretend that they don't exist. They never acknowledge that they did anything wrong. They just walk away. Meanwhile, we have the U.N. rights chief say that a Donald Trump presidency would be dangerous. Dangerous to who? Dangerous to the global elitist that he works for. Understand that the U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights, Al Hussein, is a former member of the World Bank Advisory Committee. Those are the people to whom a Donald Trump presidency would be dangerous. And he goes on to say, if Donald Trump is elected on the basis of what he said already, uh, I think it's without a doubt that he would be dangerous from an international point of view. And he tries to couch this in terms of depriving people of their human rights. Let me explain to you. Nobody has a right to become an American citizen. Nobody has a right to emigrate to America. Nobody has a right to come here and be supported by welfare. But they don't have a right to come here as immigrants. That is something that we extend to people. The people who are already here extend the privilege to come here. They don't have a right. It is a privilege that is decided by the people of America, not by the U.N. human rights chief. And as a matter of fact, as we saw in the released Hillary Clinton emails three years ago, she was saying about Jordan. And coincidentally, Al Hussein is from Jordan. And so she was talking about the Syrian refugee situation three years ago vis-a-vis -vis Jordan, and she said, well, in Jordan, they can't possibly vet all those refugees, so they don't know if jihadis are coming in with the legitimate refugees. How is that different from Donald Trump saying, we have to stop immigration from those countries until we can figure out who's coming in? Except when he says it, it's racist. When Hillary Clinton says it in private, it's not racist, because she has a different public private, uh, policy than she has uh, private. Understand that Donald Trump Nailed it when he went back to these emails that have come out. We've seen what Hillary Clinton has said about the global governance, the corporate governance. And Donald Trump said this to sum it up. He said, this criminal government cartel doesn't recognize borders, but believes in global governance, unlimited immigration, and rule by corporations. That's precisely what we see with the open borders, with the managed trade managed by an international committee that's not elected or accountable to any of the countries that are uh, that have uh, representation and not representation but membership in these trade treaties finally we have to understand the true risk that is involved in open borders not only destroying the country but endangering our people 
We have a U.S. cardinal saying that Islam desires world conquest and we're easy prey. This is a story from the New American. Uh, this is, uh, they start out with a quote from Gaddafi back in 2006. Muammar Gaddafi said, we have 50 million Muslims in Europe. There are signs that Allah will grant Islam victory in Europe. Without swords, without guns, without conquest, we will turn it into a Muslim continent within a few decades. Now, that was 10 years ago. Muammar Gaddafi said that. Now, the cardinal, Cardinal Raymond Burke, said in an interview with an Italian newspaper, Muslims have as their ultimate goal conquest and power over the world. They want a worldwide caliphate. They will accept nothing less. Anything less than a worldwide caliphate is a repudiation of their religion. And you have to understand, their religion is a theocracy. A theocracy. That's why it should be anathema to anyone, regardless of whether they're Christians or atheists or Buddhists or Hindus or whatever. Anyone who supports democracy, republics, anyone who supports the kind of governments that we have throughout the West should be absolutely afraid of the kind of theocracy that the Muslims are going to enact, the Sharia law that's going to come with that. Now, this is, this former cardinal said, several times I have heard Islamists explaining what we have failed to do with weapons in the past, we are doing today with birth rate and immigration. The population is changing. If this keeps up in countries like Italy, the majority will be Muslim. Of course it will be. Italy used to have the highest birth rate of any of the European countries. Now it's down to one child per family, while the Muslims that come in are having four to five children. The Muslims are doubling in population, and the uh, Italians are having in pop cutting in half each successive generation. Stay with us when we come back. We're going to be talking about more of those WikiLeak releases that happened today, the fourth release. We'll be right back. I was raised a practicing Muslim and remained one for almost half my life. I attended madrasas, that is Islamic schools, and memorized large parts of the Quran. As a child, I lived in Mecca for a time and frequently visited the Grand Mosque. As a teenager, I sympathized with the Muslim Brotherhood. At 22, while my family was living in Kenya, my father arranged my marriage to a member of our family clan, a man that I had never met. I ran away, made my way to Holland, studied there, and eventually was elected a member of the Dutch parliament. Now I live in the United States. In short, I have seen Islam from the inside and the outside. I believe that a reform of Islam is necessary and possible. And only Muslims can make that reform a reality. But we in the West cannot remain on the sidelines as though the outcome of this struggle has nothing to do with us. If the jihadists win and the hope for a reformed Islam dies, the rest of the world will pay a terrible price. The terror attacks in New York, London, Madrid, Paris, and many other places are only a preview for what's to come. For this reason, I believe that it's foolish to insist, as Western leaders habitually do, that the violent acts committed in the name of Islam can somehow be divorced from the religion itself. For more than a decade, my message has been simple. Islam is not a religion of peace. When I assert this, I do not mean that Islamic belief makes all Muslims violent. This is manifestly not the case. There are many millions of peaceful Muslims in the world. What I do say is that the call to violence and the justification for it are explicitly stated in the sacred texts of Islam. Moreover, this theologically sanctioned violence is there to be activated by any number of offenses, including, but not limited to, adultery, blasphemy, homosexuality and apostasy, that is to leave Islam. Those who tolerate this intolerance do so at their peril. As someone who has known what it is to live without freedom, I watch in amazement as those who call themselves liberals and progressives, people who claim to believe so fervently in individual liberty and minority rights, make common cause with the forces in the world that manifestly pose the greatest threat to that very freedom and those very minorities. In 2014, I was invited to accept an honorary degree from Brandeis University for the work I have done on behalf of women's rights in the Muslim world. That invitation was withdrawn after professors and students protested my criticism of Islam. My subsequent disinvitation, as it came to be called, was no favor to Muslims, just the opposite. 
By labeling critical examination of Islam as inherently racist, we make the chances of reformation far less likely. There are no limits on criticism of Christianity at American universities or anywhere else for that matter. Why should there be of Islam? Instead of contorting Western intellectual traditions so as not to offend our Muslim fellow citizens, we need to defend both those traditions and the Muslim dissidents who take great risks to promote them. We should support these brave men and women in every way possible. Imagine a platform for Muslim dissidents that communicated their message through YouTube, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. These are the Muslims we should be supporting for our sake as much as for the sake of Islam. In the Cold War, the West celebrated dissidents such as Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Andrei Sakharov and Vaclav Havel, who had the courage to challenge the Soviet system from within. Today, there are many dissidents who challenge Islam, but the West either ignores them or dismisses them as not representative. This is a grave mistake. Reformers such as Taufik Hamid, Asra Nomani, and Zuhi Jasser, and many others must be supported and protected. They should be as well known as Solzhenitsyn, Sakharov, and Havel were in the 1980s. If we do in fact support political, social, and religious freedom, then we cannot in good conscience give Islam a free pass on the grounds of multicultural sensitivity. We need to say to Muslims living in the West, if you want to live in our societies, to share in the material benefits, then you need to accept that our freedoms are not optional. Islam is at a crossroads of reformation or self-destruction, but so is the West. I'm Ayan Hirsi Ali of Harvard University for Prager University. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Danny Williams, uh, now of Hot Springs, Arkansas, grew up in Little Rock there at the Capitol, uh, where his mother reportedly met the uh, governor, Bill Clinton, is here with us. I remember interviewing your aunt back in the late 1990s, a uh, church lady, um, you know, many years, hard worker, great record. You yourself got three children, no record, uh, hardworking guy. Uh, I think your story is very, very incredible. We're going to walk through it and talk about it today, but thanks for coming to Austin, Texas, sir. Nice to nice to have him here. We'll uh, turn his mic on for folks. Uh, Danny, where to begin here? I mean, let's talk about you personally, where you're right. from, uh, where you grew up, and, and then we'll start talking about the first time you ever heard from your mother um, that a certain person was your father. Right. Um, my name is Danny Williams. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm at age 30 right now. And all my life I've been told that Bill Clinton was my father by my mom, my aunt, and other relatives that grew up with me. Uh, I mean, continue. I mean, I know you haven't been on TV before. You're live uh, right now. Please keep going. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, yes, I want to know the truth about Bill Clinton being my father. And that's all I ask is the truth. Do you think Bill Clinton's your father? Yes, sir. You know, instead of just going through your whole history, and we're going to do it and, and mm -hmm. talk about it, play clips of Clinton being asked about you by the press, and he won't respond. We, we're teleprompter free here. I just, out of the gates, Bill Clinton will be watching this. This is undoubted. Right. You know, Obama responded to us yesterday, Hillary, a few weeks ago. They right. watch every day. This, this shows in thousands of newspapers a day, all over every cable channel. Yes, sir. We didn't do some pre-interview here. You just flew in at like 11 o'clock today. You just got here about an hour ago. Right. Look at that camera right there, sir. Camera four. Bill Clinton, William Jeffrey, uh, William Jeffrey Clinton will either be watching this live or he'll watch it later. What do you want to say to Bill Clinton? Camera four. I mean, I'd just like to ask and say to Bill Clinton that I, I want to meet you. I want to shake your hand. I want my kids to know their grandfathers. Um, and i like to just, you know... I like to just meet them, get to know them, you know, and I mean, I never had a father in my life, so, you know, it's hard, it's difficult in, in explaining it, you know. It's okay, go with it, it's all right. right. So I've right. talked to you in private, I understand coming from the middle of Arkansas to now being with the top link on Drudge, and you can see yourself right there and right. and all over the world, but just tell it like it is, You, I mean, 
You you believe Bill Clinton's your father? Your mother always told you that. He sent you money, all the rest of it. Right. He won't respond to it. So Bill Clinton and Hillary are watching right now. Right. Talk about an epic story. Uh, the, the, the the videos on your Facebook, it's on InfoWars, trying right. to go over the fence at the governor's mansion. You, you, you wanted to meet your daddy. I mean, you're meeting him right now digitally. Right. Right there, my friend. What do you want to say? Uh, I want to, I like to say, uh, my name is Danny Wee. I like to just say, you know, I want, I want to, I want to be able to experience that having a father in your life. You know what I'm saying? And now I got kids of my own. I want my kids to know their grandfather. They ask me all the time, "Who's your dad?" You know. So, I mean, it's my chance now and and get my story out and letting the world know who I am and who's my father and you know the truth about everything. Well, the Daily Mail has the headline: uh, Bill Clinton's grandkids. You know, will he will he look into meeting with them? Um, we'll go back to that in a moment, but, but just starting at the beginning, Okay. break down how you grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. You're now in Hot Springs, what it was like. And when you first began to hear this. Okay. Um, well, growing up in Arkansas, it was like every, everybody knew everybody, you know, they'd say that's Bill Clinton's son and everywhere I go, you know, so I mean, growing up, it was rough growing up. I mean, we, we barely was making it. We was we was broke. I mean, my aunt, she, she, she worked two jobs trying to raise us, me and my little brothers and sisters. I mean, everybody in Arkansas at the time I was coming up knew about me being his son, preachers and all. So I just want to be able to just you know, had a chance and get myself out and explaining who I am and why am I facing the world today to reach my father. What is your guilty pleasure? Ah, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> Are there that many? <laughs> well, I'm just trying to think of, you know, the G-rated ones. No, I don't think Years ago, if you were an attractive female, unfortunate enough to be within the circle of sexual predator Bill Clinton, you would eventually find yourself escorted to a hotel room by an Arkansas state trooper, where the former governor would meet you wearing nothing but a creepy smile demanding you perform a sex act on him. Just ask Paula Jones. She settled a case with Bill Clinton for the same reasons with an $850,000 payout. Other women have come forward with identical stories. Here's an inebriated Bill Clinton during his 1992 presidential campaign groping a flight attendant. Bill Clinton on the same flight later exposed himself and grabbed flight attendant Christy Zercher's breasts after asking her to perform a sex act on him. She was later threatened by White House attorney Bruce Lindsay to keep quiet. That is the behavior that has been superimposed onto Donald Trump by the mainstream media. The woman at the center of that explosive tape is now speaking out. Said there is no room for objectification of women or anyone for that matter, not even in the locker room. Well, it's, it's a crime. I mean, I prosecuted sex crimes. That's a sexual assault, classic sexual assault. People go to jail for that. He wants Hillary Clinton to go to jail. Maybe he needs to go to jail. Hillary Clinton is on the stage. Hillary Clinton is running for president, not her husband. Um, this makes sense. This is politically uh, incorrect, what Donald Trump did. This is bringing a whole nother level, level of gutter. Yeah. That, that's rape culture, Kathy. You're blaming her. someone who succumbed to someone committing adultery on her. Bill's secretive behavior continued until Monica Lewinsky blew it wide open. All the while, Hillary Clinton served as an attack dog, threatening the victims, clearing the path on her and Bill's Luciferian Bonnie and Clyde Trojan horse to the upper echelons of power and wealth. Now all anyone has to do to be mind raped by the Clinton crime machine is to turn on any cable news network. Let's start with what people describe as Trump sort of hovering and lurking. The last 10 days could have been about nothing but emails, nothing but negatives about Hillary Clinton. 
but there's Donald Trump. The use of propaganda is exploding after being legalized in 2013. While America slept, an amendment overturned the long-standing Smith-Munt Act of 1948 and the Foreign Relations Authorization Act of 1987, allowing for materials produced by the State Department and the Broadcasting Board of Governors to be released within U.S. borders. Michael Hastings of BuzzFeed.com put it this way. The new law would give sweeping powers to the State Department and Pentagon to push television, radio, newspaper, and social media on to the U.S. public. It removes the protection for Americans, says a Pentagon official who is concerned about the law. It removes oversight from the people who want to put out this information. There are no checks and balances. No one knows if the information is accurate, partially accurate, or entirely false. CNN's Jeff Zucker just ordered an all-out blackout on the reporting of Bill Clinton's illegitimate son. That's propaganda in a nutshell. True journalism should have zero bias. But in true dualistic fashion, the faceless people actually concerned about the future of the republic are the ones being attacked by the criminals running the show. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. The other guy's base is what I grew up in. You know, I'm basically your standard redneck. No doubt about it. The American consciousness might as well be in a Little Rock, Arkansas hotel room right now with Arkansas state troopers guarding the door while all the hopes and dreams of the American ideal are brutally raped inside by the Clinton crime machine, the Bush dynasty, and the descendants of the robber barons who continue to stalk and brainwash the good people of the United States with unyielding criminal intent. John Bound for Infowars.com. Have you posted any disparaging facts about Hillary Clinton online anytime, say, within the last year, only to find that you were immediately attacked by a bunch of strangers online, possibly some eggs on Twitter? Well, Never fear. It's not as if Hillary Clinton just has a massive amount of uh, authentic support out there. These are actually manufactured trolls. It's an AstroTurf outrage machine of these paid trolls. It's part of a program called Breaking Barriers. Now, I want to take your attention to this article by Rachel Alexander from the stream. Uh, it's really good. It gets into detail about the Breaking Barriers project. Just to give you an idea about the size and scope of this, initially it was spending about one $1 million on this project, but now that has been increased to over $6 million. That's how unpopular Hillary Clinton is. She has trolls working overtime, had to increase the super PAC money, go into this Breaking Barriers program to $6 million plus dollars. So these are paid trolls, and they're posting on social media sites like Facebook, Reddit, Instagram, and Twitter. And it's uh, they create many, many accounts to give the appearance that Hillary Clinton has has just massive amounts of support out there, which of course she does not. Now, Libby Watson of the Sunlight Foundation told the Daily Beast that this seems to be going after essentially random individuals online. And in fact, they are moving from just defending Hillary Clinton or rebutting you with some facts to actually targeting and intimidating people who criticize her. Now, uh, this is also kind of gives this uh, this impression that she just has this groundswell of authentic support that she's this populist um, political person out there, but she's not. This is exactly what Hillary Clinton's campaign is known for. It's highly tactical, highly paid for. Um, these are law lifetime political operatives, high level people handling this. So Hillary's anonymous trolls they first started targeting Bernie Sanders people. Now we thought of course it was really strange when we would see all of these Bernie Sanders people at the Trump rallies and you're thinking why are they attacking Donald Trump supporters when it's Hillary Clinton that is Bernie Sanders main opponent so they're actually bussing in people who would have should have been going to Hillary Clinton's rallies and <laughs> going after someone that wasn't even her main target then very smart I mean they're spending a lot of money they're incredibly incredibly 
smart there at the Clinton campaign. They just use their powers for evil. Now, the, the moderators of some of the Sanders subreddits were the first people to point this out. They noticed that a lot of the accounts switched from supporting Bernie to then going and saying they, they switched. Now they're supporting Hillary Clinton. Um, they also, you'll recall, there was that whole Bernie bro movement, and a lot of women online were saying, oh, these Bernie bros, they're so terrible, they're racist, and they're sexist uh, males, and they're coming after us. Who are these Bernie bros? Turns out the Bernie bros were actually a part of this Breaking Barriers program, and they were created by these fake accounts in order to give this impression that Bernie Sanders supporters were just young, racist, sexist. Where have we seen this before? This is exactly what was coming with the whole Pepe the Frog meme and how everyone on the alt-right and all these people, racist, sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic. So I can almost guarantee that a lot of these Pepe memes were generated by these paid operatives as part of the Breaking Barriers program. Now, uh, they also read it. A lot of people there in Reddit were able to prove that they were actually Clinton staffers who are running a lot of the uh, subreddit, the Donald, and they outed them. They actually were able to prove that they created a lot of fake websites, uh, registered a, a, a pack called Feel the Burn. You'll recall we reported on a video that showed a young Hispanic children using profanity in reference to Trump. They were beating up pinata image of him. Well, they it appeared that that came from the Sanders campaign when it didn't. It, it, they even included a link to the Sanders campaign to give it uh, the authenticity that Bernie Sanders and his supporters had put this ad out that was uh, targeting Trump. Well, it turns out they looked in the source codes in this website and it was actually a leftover from another site called Bill for First Lady 2016. It was created by a Clinton staffer. So this tactic is nothing new to the Hillary Clinton campaign. They've been using anonymous trolls at least as far back as 2007, creating these fake accounts to make it appear as though she had more support. Uh, Robbie Mook, who she brought on as one of her campaign managers, actually started a listserv in 2009 called Mook's Mafia so he could share political information and come after Republicans. So this is the kind of tactic she's wanting to do, a Linskyite, anything to win. But just know, any of you trolls out there creating these fake accounts, you are creating an online footprint that isn't going to go anywhere. Anyone smart enough to look at the source code is going to be able to find you out forever. Welcome back. Joining me now are Margaret Howell and Leanne McAdoo to take a look at the latest WikiLeaks releases. Now, it was just yesterday we had the third batch. Today, starting about 7.30 this morning, WikiLeaks released another 1,193 emails, and this brings the total of about 6,500 emails out of approximately 50,000. Mm -hmm. So they're coming at a very quick pace now, mm -hmm. but it has to do that because we're still uh, only about 10% of what he right. says he has. 26 days out and we're seeing how much we're having to struggle to get the media to even give this 15 minutes of time. Which is, I, I wish he had started this process earlier, but I believe last week when he said he was going to release these emails, I really did believe he's going to release them in his own time. Mm -hmm. And now it is starting to come out fairly quickly and it's difficult even now for the press to go through and to vet all of the stuff that's coming out so quickly. Because, right. again, uh, today it was uh, another 1,200 emails that came out. Well, not only that, but, you know, what we're, what we're understanding because of these, you know, David, are they want us compliant and dumb. They don't want us to question anything. Saudi Arabia is supporting terrorism. Oh, that's a shocker. They're also Clinton Foundation donors. And a trove of things that were very speculative, they're now being confirmed and it's remarkable that yet the mainstream media isn't even putting this front and center because this is of critical importance to any voter 26 mm -hmm. days out. And the fact that they want us compliant and dumb is a big deal. I know Alex talked about that yesterday. And then today we're, we're seeing a realization that, oh, yeah, by the way, they also try to filtra infiltrate religious organizations like the Catholic Church. They want this progressive revolution. They want to see the deterioration of faith in this country. And it's remarkable that we're, aside from Reddit and other sources, we're the only ones talking about this. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what, what's developing is we're, we're seeing the real difference between the private 
and the public face of Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. and the media as well. And, and let's talk about this in terms of some categories, because what we've got, you mentioned some of the uh, issues out there. We've got really several different broad categories. We've got the collusion of the media that we can see in these emails. We've got government collusion between the Clinton campaign, between the Obama administration, the Department of Justice, the State Department, so forth and so on. Then we have the calculated lies and the conspiracy plans in terms of things like the uh, takedown of the Catholic Spring, as they're calling it, right. you know, attacking Catholics. And then we see how she is the bankster's friend, you know, coming out and talking about how she shares their goal, their ambition, their dream of a one world government, beginning with a hemispheric uh, North American Union. She doesn't right. use the term North American Union, but she defines it in every aspect. Let's look at the uh, first uh, category here, media collusion. Now, we've seen all of these different media outlets that are not only sending her questions before a town right. hall, the exact question they had. Like verbatim. Uh, verbatim, the exact question so she could prepare, focus group, uh, create sp responses to that and test that with her uh, focus groups to come back and say, well, this is what I think about the death penalty. That was one example. Then giving them editorial, uh, giving her editorial control over the interviews, which quotes will be included and so forth. Many right. other things. Well, yes, and, and something else that I thought was pretty interesting was how we're always seeing how she's giving these interviews. A few days after her collapse, she came out, but she wasn't on camera, and it was a telephone interview, and she just sounds so lovely and nice. Chris Hayes, actually, here we find out that he, in this pre-taped interview, he had sent out a question, and so she's reading off of a script. That's mm -hmm. why she does these mm -hmm. telephone interviews without a camera present because she's she's got the question right there and she's reading off a script. And we also know from these WikiLeaks uh, that Chris Hayes is one of her surrogate mm -hmm. there in the media. They're so yes. very yeah. friendly to her. Yeah, <laughs> even to the extent that they, they say, can we survive not answering questions from the press? <laughs> and she went uh, nearly, she went about 80% of the through the campaign mm -hmm. not having a single press conference. And now... She supposedly is having press conferences, if you can call these press conferences. Right. Uh, they are press releases. They're PR <laughs> events, okay, that with collusion, as we see, between the mainstream media and with Hillary Clinton. That's the other part of what we see here. So, first of all, they shut down anybody who's going to ask any real questions, and then they work very tightly with mm -hmm. these different organizations. The New York Times, uh, the uh, Boston Globe, how are we going to increase her presence, okay? The Washington Post bureau chief. Uh, protected Podesta. We have all these different things now that are coming out of the. Well, yes, uh, we even have now Louise Mensch, who's a you know longtime conservative, you know on the far right. She's even giving us scripted. I'd really love to see Hillary Clinton put out this type of an ad and kind of scripts it all for her. Yeah. You know, and I mean, it's like on all sides. <laughs> So then we look at the government collusion. We know that the media is in our pocket, okay? But look at the government collusion. These are some of the headlines that have come out uh, just in the last couple of days off of just the top of the Drudge Report. This isn't even digging down deep into all of the emails. The Clinton camp appeared to have contacts with the Department of Justice on the email case. At the same time, the State Department is coordinating the email release with the Clinton campaign. And then we see the White House says, oh, no, there wasn't any a collusion between us, right. okay? And yet we see that the media staffers are discussing which ones they're going to release and which ones they're going to delete. <laughs> How do they get the power to do that if there's no collusion with the Justice Department? Right. We see that they had immunity deals with Cheryl Mills and others. They had to give them immunity before they would agree to turn over their laptops. They mm -hmm. knew that it had incriminating information there. They demanded that they get immunity deals and that the government doesn't ever do that with anybody else. They just come in and take what they know has criminal information on it. They've done that with, right. uh, with whistleblowers. They've done that with former CIA director. Uh, they, but with Hillary Clinton, it's a different set of rules. Right. Not only did they give uh, Cheryl Mills criminal immunity, they also gave the two techies that set up Hillary Clinton's email server criminal immunity as well in an unprecedented way. And they said any FBI agent looking at this case, if you talk about it publicly, you will be censored. You could yeah. possibly lose your pensions over this. I mean, it was like they were protecting her and not even the agents examining the case. It was very unprecedented, mm -hmm. David. Well, you when mentioned you look at the way they do the immunity, always in the past, they would give immunity to the people who are lower down, like the tech people you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. They would do that so they could get the people higher up. They would keep rolling them up. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that this this time, and they didn't do that twenty years ago with Charlie Tree and the and the uh, the issues with the campaign uh, money laundering for the Clintons. They gave him immunity. 
And then they didn't prosecute him or anybody else. They, did, they got the information. They knew that it was crooked. They knew it was money laundering, but nobody went to jail. And the same thing is happening here. They right. give them immunity so that nobody goes to jail, but they don't use it to get convictions against anyone. Right. And what we are seeing, thanks to these WikiLeaks, is just how corrupt, how rigged the entire system is. It's a rigged reality. But they are painting it as if we can't look at what is inside of the hack, what what information is being revealed. We just have to be scared because it's the Russians and they've hacked in and how dare they get this information. Wasn't it just a few years ago they were all convincing us, well, hey, if you've got nothing to hide, shouldn't be worried about See something, say something. In your email. Right. Unless yeah. you have something that's uh, criminally, you know, that makes us liable, then of course we will prosecute. I think it's hilarious that Julian Assange has come out the criminal in this. And uh, I was looking at the Twitter war that was happening in between WikiLeaks and the Clinton camp this morning. And uh, this Brian Fallon, who is responsible for representing the Clinton campaign, he says the media needs to stop treating WikiLeaks like the same as if it's a FOIA request. So FOIA would be the legal channel, the Freedom of Information Act channel to go through. Assange is Colluding with the Russian government to help Trump. Oh, really? Yeah, let's this look at the evidence that they have for that. No evidence. This is this is Homeland Security and the Director of National Intelligence. And here's what they say. This is why they say it's the Russians. They say, well, we believe, why? Based <laughs> on the scope and sensitivity of the efforts, that only Russia's senior most officials could have authorized these activities. It's consistent with the methods and the motivations of Russians. In other words, the Russians would like to see this information out there. Therefore, the Russians did it. Right. They don't know. And yet we see at the same time, we see Obama and Hillary saying, we're going to go to war against anybody that hacks uh, right. our, our information. And yeah. you see Obama putting this threat out there, physical threats, threats of sanctions, threats of war, to the Russians based on the fact that, well, we think that you have a motivation to do this. Why? Because the Clintons and the Obamas started uh, the Cold War, restarted the Cold War. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, they say they've got the motivation to do this. Right. Well, and it's very interesting how even Donna Brazil is tied up in this. She was obviously the one that forwarded along that town hall question to Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. She says she's choosing not to view any of the emails because they were hacked. She's going to ha take the moral high ground and not see look no at evil, any of these. no evil, hear yeah. no evil, no evil. And she says this country. is exactly what the Russians intended to do, and they're doing it. And I think that's really key because we have a lot of these never Trumpers that are totally okay with blaming it on the Russians with no evidence because it's it's their candidate that they want to protect. But this isn't going to end with this election cycle. But even <laughs> you mentioned the Cold War, David, even Gorbachev himself, who has basically been a recluse all these years, he's saying, look, there's a dangerous line. We covered this this morning in Odd Topic. Mm -hmm. This is a very dangerous line you're crossing. It's very reminiscent of a few decades ago. I'm paraphrasing what he said. If you have a Cold War figure coming out and saying, look, you're at that line again. We might not want to cross this. We're in, right. we're in dangerous water here. Yeah, he it, said the most and, dangerous thing is that we're not talking. And yet right. what has Donald Trump been criticized the most for the fact that he would talk to Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the time we have tonight. Thank you for joining us. Join us again tomorrow night for the InfoWars Nightly News, 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.